Hi guys and ladies, welcome to another video. Today, we have a perfumer's portfolio video. And you know, the last time you guys saw me in a suit, uh, if you've been following my channel, you know that I had a father-daughter dance that I went to maybe a couple months back. And so I was already in a nice dress suit, shirt, and I said, you know what, I'll just do the video this way. Well, today, we had picture day at work. Uh, so I had a heck of a long day and we had to take pictures and of course they wanted us in the suit so here we go this is probably the first time i've worn a suit outside of the father-daughter dance in years um because normally it's either working from home through covid or business casual at the office whatever uh so i'm in a suit and unfortunately unlike the day with my daughter which was a celebratory day a dance today is a bit of a sad day uh, not for me personally, uh, but for the fragrance family as a whole. And that is because today one of the master perfumers, Rosendo Matu, passed away. And he's a chap that's been around doing fragrances for 45 plus years, doing collaborations um, with many of the Spanish houses. And then he actually ended up starting his own brand. Uh, and the brand is named after him. It's, Ro it's Rosendu Matu. And he basically had number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. That's how he listed them. Number five got a lot of hype in the community over the last couple of years. I've seen a lot of people talking about it. It, it made lists, you know, compliment lists, all that kind of stuff. Now, I have to say I have four fragrances from... Uh, from him that he has done over the years, ranging between 1968 and 1988. So we have a pretty wide span, but I only have four of his fragrances. And I have to say, I'm not the biggest fan of his brand in particular. But that doesn't mean that, um, that he doesn't deserve the respect, admiration. He doesn't, you know, deserve the spotlight. Of course, uh, when a sad event like today happens, it's worth mentioning. It should be ce celebrated. His life should be celebrated. It's like, you know, if you're a fan of music when Kurt Cobain died, or if you're a fan of movies when Robin Williams died. If you're a perfume lover, Rosendu Matu passing away is, you know, like a... It's like a punch to the gut, you know, when somebody like that passes away, like a celebrity. Um, he basically is a perfume celebrity. He has the title since 2010. He's had the title of Master Perfumer, which is not just dawned on anybody. You, you, it's almost like a knighthood to become Master Perfumer. Um, it's, a, it's a right, you know, it's something that uh, they wear proudly because most of them spent their entire life dedicated to this. And in fact, an interesting thing that I that I found, I found an interview with him. Uh, and this interview must have happened maybe a couple years back. I'm not 100% sure. But he talked a little bit about his history and how Mr. Matu got started in the industry just in, in, in general. And he was 15 years old when he, when he uh, got his start. Which, you know, completely different world back then, I'm sure. Uh, nowadays, you, you could never hire a 15-year-old legally to, to begin work like this. Uh, but he was from Barcelona originally. And you'll notice a lot of the brands that he worked with were Spanish-type brands. You'll hear uh, Antonio Puig. Uh, you will hear Carolina Herrera if you follow his work. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of a lot of Spanish brands he had the chance to to work with, um, and so I just want to read a little bit from this obituary, or maybe not an obituary, but um, a article that Fragrantica put up. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, in in memoriam, if you will, for for his life, and uh, he it said that he suffered from a severe illness, unfortunately, so hopefully he didn't suffer. Uh, and he was born October 23rd, 1945. And again, he was born in Spain. And so most of the brands he worked with, I, I mentioned Puig, Paco Rabanne, Nina Ricci, those kind of Carolina Herrera, those kind of Spanish brands. And he got his start at 15. 
uh, and his we'll go through the the perfumes that he um, that he made that are in my collection but I just want to read a couple things from this um, from this article that I found touching and interesting so the first is uh, he says that for many years I had a dream to develop my own fragrance collection I have been interested in, in the small market of confidential fragrances. He's talking about starting his own brand after 45 years of being an industry insider and working with all these international brands and stuff like that. Um, and so he founded his brand in 2014 with his son, Joan, which I thought was really cool. Hopefully his son continues to carry on his father's legacy. So they took lots of time developing the packaging, the flacons, you know, all that good stuff. But he worked with um, Christian Carbonell while creating his brand. Um, and so they talk about, you know, interchanging Middle Eastern style with more modern ways of composing perfumery and then mixing it with the classical style, which he loves. He's done 81 fragrances in his career. Um, and going back to the interview, you know, you should go, if you click on the article that is right up on Fragrantica right now, if you're watching this later, I'm sorry to go on a tangent here, but if you click on the article that's right there on Fragrantica, there's a link to the interview, and I'm sure you can find the interview that he, that he did, but it was really interesting um, because they asked him many interesting questions, and he seems to kind of be a bit of an open book. Uh, and a couple highlights that, that he said that jumped out to me that I completely agree with is he was talking about how uh, reformulations happen. And one of the things he said is the biggest shame in the industry is when reformulations happen and the original perfumer who made the scent, who has the knowledge, if you will, of the scent, is not consulted on the actual reformulation. Could not agree more. He also basically said that it's hard to determine what will be a hit and what will not be a hit because, you know, what is a hit with the public tends to be trends and trends change. And so sometimes you could have a fantastic perfume that maybe came out at the wrong time. If you had a heavy, you know, 80s style um fragrance that uh, was rich with animalics and that kind of stuff, and you released it in the 90s when everyone was going for the aquatic craze, it, it would have flopped. Uh, and so he talked a lot about his knowledge and, you know, what what he learned over his, his 45 years together, that kind of stuff, the style. So it's a great article. You should check it out. Um, but so without harping on that for the people who are watching this inter this, you know, video later on, and, you know, the interview is not on the front page. Let's go through the perfumes. Let's talk about them because there are some amazing fragrances here. First, I do want to do scent of the day because this is a fragrance worth highlighting. It's very hard to find. And I'm so glad I grabbed three bottles when I did because stock is like basically poof gone. Um, but the fragrance itself is Chanel's Antaeus Sport. I wore this, so I, obviously, as you can see, I have the suit on, and I needed to pick a fragrance. I could have picked anything, and this is what I wanted to wear. I have this desire to wear this fragrance. Like, every time I look in my cabinet, I just want to wear this. Um, it is so amazing. I absolutely love how they kept the DNA of Antaeus, which I love so much, um, and what they did basically is they removed the uh, myrrh, so they they stripped the myrrh back in the in the opening, so it's not as resinous. And they added some things underneath, uh, like vetiver and stuff like that. But by removing those more resinous notes, it's almost like the castorium is put front and center. So for a sport fragrance, you would think, oh, this is going to be easier to wear and all that stuff. And maybe it's because it's you know, in the 90s uh, here in May in Texas, and I'm wearing a sport fragrance, so I feel a little bit more weather specific. But I'll tell you what, wearing this just, you know, at work, I just feel like a man amongst boys. It's absolutely amazing. I just, I love the DNA of Antaeus, and I love the DNA of Antaeus Sport. Um, it is truly a gem. 
uh, and it really is turning into a unicorn. They only produced it for a year or two. So if you can find a bottle, you know, and you're in, you're into the things that I'm into, I would highly, highly, highly encourage this. Um, not many fragrances get three highlies from me, but, but here's, here's one that I, you know, of course it is discontinued, hard to find, but there are bottles floating around. Sport, Antaeus Sport Cologne. Love every second of wearing that today. It's a, it's a joy and a pleasure to wear that. All right, so let's talk about the Rosendu Matu fragrances in my collection. So the first one is all the way back to 1968, like I said. And I think it's still available for, for purchase, but I think it's been reformulated not in the best way. So this is an older bottle. You know, if you go look at Parfumo, you'll see the new bottle design. Um, but this is a fragrance from Puig. Three out of the four are from the house of, of Antonio Puig. And this is called Aqua, Agua Brava. And this is basically this spicy, woody scent. It's an eau de cologne, if you take a look. You can see the eau de cologne concentration. And this is a splash. This is a splash that I ended up getting from Anuj. So I don't know exactly the year on this, but I and I haven't had a chance to give it a full wear yet. But I will tell you that I decanted some and I've worn it to bed a couple of times, which is what I'll do so I can get an extra wear of a fragrance in because I only allow myself to wear one fragrance a day. So before bed, I'll throw something like this on so I can keep my nose, you know, fresh, accustomed to other fragrances in my collection. And I really like the lavender in this, in this perfume. Um, it's basically bergamot, lavender, sage, juniper, lemon in the top with carnation, bay leaf, pine, and then a base of leather, moss, musk, patchouli, sandalwood, and vetiver. And it's a, for an eau de cologne, you know, we're talking 1963. I was just talking about a fragrance that came out, or 1968, I'm sorry, I was just talking about a fragrance that came out in the 60s that uh, really took me, and I would love to have a bottle, uh, Monsieur L'Envon. And this is another 60s fragrance that's worth owning. It's not, you know, it doesn't, it didn't have the wow factor of Monsieur L'Envon, uh, it doesn't have the depth of that, but you don't always want something that has some animalic side to it with, you know, big florals and stuff like that. You don't always want something like that. Sometimes you want an eau de cologne that's just pleasant, easy to wear, but still unique and high quality. This is where Agua Brava, I would say, com can come in. Um, and this is a um, 100 ml bottle. And so I would say if you can find one of these older bottles, uh, because there is oak moss in the base, uh, leather and oak moss in the base, you're going to get a closer interpretation of what uh, Mr. Matu wanted this perfume to smell like. Now, this was a collaboration. A couple of his perfumes are collaborations. Uh, Marcel Carls is the other perfumer. Um, and I don't, I'm not familiar with his work at all either, but, um, if you're looking for, I like to wear something like this in the summer. So if you're looking for something that's, you know, an eau de cologne, something you can just kind of splash on, but is still different enough from the crowd. This is fantastic. This is a great fragrance. And if you, if you're a lavender lover, put this on the list. Um, the, if you take a look at the aesthetic you can tell they would never do packaging like this today. And that's why the packaging on the new one, you'll notice has changed. They kept the bottle shape, but they changed the color scheme a little bit and they changed the writing and they made it a little bit more modern. This looks so 70s, 80s to me, even though this is 60s fragrance. This looks so 70s, 80s to me. It has that, you know, uh, 70s, 80s, very masculine, um, you know, they, they, uh, almost like you're looking at a plaid couch from the 1970s, you know, or one of those old school jackets, like, uh, they used to wear with the patches on the elbows, uh, very old school to me, 
which I absolutely love because I like vintage stuff like this. But the first one is Agua Brava. This is the oldest. I don't know if this is the first perfume he ever created, but it has to be one of the first at in from 1968. Okay, next we're going to go to probably his most popular fragrance. Uh, we're going to jump to the year 1981, 1982. Some of the um, sites disagree. Uh Fragrantica has 1981, and Parfumo has 1982. Also, Parfumo only lists one perfumer for this, and that's Sebastian Gomez, whereas Fragrantica lists Rosen, Rosendal Matu, Max Gavari, and Carlos Benaim as the three perfumer duet that made Quorum. That sounds closer to the truth, especially since they did an entire interview with him and they listed Quorum as one of his greatest accomplishments. And if you're into old school fragrances, like, for example, if you are into uh, YSL's Koros, if you're into Antaeus, never mind the hard-to-find sport cologne version, but if you're just into regular Antaeus, um, if you're into fragrances like Leonard Poron, which is right up here from the 80s, if you're into um, 80s fragrances, masculine, heavy 80s fragrances, uh, Bellamy, that kind of thing, this is a different take. It's a little more woody, aromatic. Um, it'll remind you maybe a touch of Polo Green uh, because of the big Artemisia pine oak moss combo going on. And that pine and tobacco will, it'll give you a slight memory of Polo Green, but this definitely stands on its own. The older bottles, if you want to know how to date these, the older bottles have Antonio Puig down here, the full name, Antonio Puig. The new bottles just say Puig. So if you're having a hard time kind of finding an older bottle, that's something to look for. Not everyone knows that. So sometimes you'll find one because the, the way that they look is very similar other to Antonio Puig down here. Uh, or I, I think maybe it doesn't even say anything on the, on the real new ones. So sometimes since they look so similar, people will just throw these old bottles up there with the other stock because this is a very cheap fragrance right now for current stock. You can get this for 13, 15, 18 bucks, right? Something like that. Less than 20 for sure. And so if you can find one of these older bottles, you'll get the oak moss that's really turned up. Cor uh, Antonio Puig is not going to use molecular distillation and remove the bad parts of oak moss. You know, they're not going to do that. They're just so they're just going to reduce the oak moss and try to substitute it with something else increase the patchouli or increase, you know, maybe add vetiver or something to the mix to trick you into thinking it's oak moss. If you want to smell the one with the real oak moss, go for the one that says Antonio Puig down here on the bottom. Uh, but this scent is probably um, Rosendu Matu's uh, most popular scent. Uh, it is up there with those old school 80 masculines, you know, the Mount Rushmore of the old school 80s masculines, if you will. It's Artemisia, caraway, lemon, bergamot, grapefruit with pine, sandalwood, patchouli, carnation, jasmine, cyclamen, oak moss, tobacco, leather, and amber. So if you like fragrances like Polo Green, and I absolutely love Polo Green from 1978, this came out a couple years later. This was competing with fragrances like Coros, Antaeus, uh, Santos de Cartier, that kind of stuff. And uh, it's right there. If you're a lover of vintage masculines and you've never checked out Corum, it is a must. It's not my favorite of the list. And again, look at the, look at the packaging that Puig used to do back then. I mean, look at these packagings. These, <laughs> this color scheme would absolutely not fly today. Um, I just, you know, it's it's so eight, so 70s, 80s to me, just the, the color scheme that they used back then. Um, let's see, can you see the bottom of this? I don't know if you'll be able to, but I'll try. 
Ah, there you go. Maybe you can't see it. So that's the bottom of, of the vintage quorum bottle. And then uh, we're going to jump to the year 1986. And we're going to do a sport flanker of my father's signature scent, which is Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. This is called Sport de Paco Rabanne. And as you can see right there, it says demonstration not for sale. So this is an old tester bottle that I bought. Uh, this was the original way that this fragrance was released with the raised R right here. You can see it has the raised R. And then they put it in a bottle that looks like the design of the bottle looks exactly the same, but it goes green. Like it looks like it's green. And uh, it says, um, it says Sport de Paco Rabanne, but Sport is real big. So see how Sport's small right there? It's like, it takes up the whole screen. It says Sport de Paco Rabanne. Um, and either bottle on this one, versions don't matter. Just finding a bottle is what matters. These are getting harder and harder to find. And my father only wore one scent his entire life. And that's Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. That's it. And this is the only time I ever got him to, to try something else. I made him a decant of this, and he said, yes, I would absolutely wear this. And the only other fragrance he would ever wear, basically, is Sport de Paco Rabanne. So Sport de Paco Rabanne is, is one of those sport fragrances that came out in the 80s when sport fragrances were turning popular. There were some Coro sport flankers. Uh, Boss, Hugo Boss did Boss Sport, which I absolutely love. That's one of my favorite sports. And then as you can see, Antaeus did a Sport Cologne, which most people don't even know exists because uh, it only lasted about a year. But it was in vogue in the mid-80s. I think this was 84, 85. Uh, this was 86. It was, it was in vogue to do a Sport Flanker all of a sudden. But what was funny back then is the sport flankers were nothing like the sport flankers are now. If you could smell this sport de Paco Rabanne, or if you could smell this Antaeus sport cologne, you would be absolutely stunned that these are sport fragrances. They they made them more for they were they were supposed to be sport fragrances in that you put it on, you go play tennis or whatever you know you were gonna do back then in the 80s. Um, but it still had that heavy 80s masculine. It, it wasn't one of these ethereal, transparent, you spray it on, it's gone in 30 minutes. No, these things lasted. These sport flankers will beat some modern day X-ray de parfum or, you know, all that stuff these houses try to do nowadays. Parfum, X-ray de parfum. These sport flankers will beat them. Uh, and this is basically lemon. Mandarin orange, bergamot, petit grand, lavender, artemisia, with iris, jasmine, juniper, tarragon, rose, and carnation, oak moss, balsam fir, cedar wood, patchouli, vetiver, musk, and leather. There is a little bit of the Paco Rabanne Pour Homme DNA underneath, but they made it very fresh and uplifting. This is a this is a fragrance that you know, you put on and it, it really lifts you up. It doesn't weigh you down. It doesn't drag you down. It's optimistic. It's, you know, that kind of vibe. Summery is what I think of. I think I wore this 4th of July last year. So there's a fantastic scent memory attached, attached to this fragrance. That kind of thing. You know, it has that you're with family, it's hot outside, but you're enjoying yourself and you don't have to carry around a decant to reapply. That kind of thing. Um... So Sport de Paco Rabanne is another, is another of these 80s sport flankers that if you're into that kind of thing, if you're into vintages like I am, this is definitely one to hunt down. I mentioned Boss Sport is another one to put on the list. Uh, but this is one where I believe um, Rosen du Matteau worked alone. He did not have any other perfumers that uh, worked with him. This was a solo effort, and he did a fantastic job on this fragrance. One of my top three or four sport fragrances, if you will. Um, although, I have to say, I am absolutely smitten with this. This instantly jumped to my number one sport fragrance, this um, 
Chanel Antaeus at Sport Cologne. Absolutely amazing. Um, but this is a fragrance about Rose and Duma too, so that is number three. Now we have one more left. And we're back to a collaboration. This time with Alberto Morias. And we're going to jump to the year 1988. And this is the final Rose and Duma 2 fragrance I own. I don't own any from his brand. Um, like I said, I wasn't taken with his brand. And I don't own any of his new stuff. This is the final one. It's a, it's a spicy Schieffer fragrance. And it's called Sybaris. And Sybaris is a creation by the House of Puige again. And so you can really see that Spanish influence that uh, Rosenduma II had on the house. Um, and, and on the brands that he worked for. He really kind of stayed close to, to home. Um, and this is discontinued. This is no longer available. But I have seen bottles that are very reasonably priced. Made in Spain, 50 ml. I think I got this 50 ml bottle for like 35 bucks or something a year or two ago. Very um, reasonably priced. And I think there's still bottles floating around. Although prices are starting to move up, you don't have to mortgage your house or and get a reverse mortgage to, to get Sybaris. Um, but basically what it is, is it opens up with this aldehydic green opening with citruses and a hit of cumin. And the cumin here mixes instantly with this cinnamon um, and a, a little bit of florals. There's geranium, carnation, jasmine. There's some green artemisia touches. Uh, and the aldehydes and the cumin and the cinnamon might put you off when you first smell. It might wrong foot you a little bit. It did for me the first time I ever wore this. I didn't like the way that the cumin and the cinnamon mixed. It it gave off almost like it was too much, you know. Cumin is is one thing, cinnamon is another, and when they just mix, they just create this blend uh, that just really hit me and, and it wrong-footed me. However, uh, if you stick with it, the first half an hour, 45 minutes is challenging, but to my nose, it does really open up and you can start to appreciate some of the more beautiful elements of this. For example, there's frankincense in this perfume. Uh, there's leather, there's oak moss, there's patchouli, there's vetiver. There's a lot going on in the base and it is a proper chiffre. If you're a fan of complex chiffre fragrances, old school, real oak moss, you, you can't ask for much more of a fragrance than this. It's just that the opening is a little challenging. You can't be somebody who sprays this on and judges it for spray. You know, you have to wear it. You have to give it time to develop and know the perfume and, and understand it or else you won't like this. Only on the second wear did I really start to appreciate some of the nuances. And I will continue to wear this. Eventually, I'll do a, a full review on the Rosenduma 2 fragrances. Uh, but these are the only four I have in my collection, unfortunately. He's done a lot of other things. Um, I was looking at some of the other things that he's done, just to highlight some, since this is a video about him uh, and his life. And let's see if I can pull some of them up really quick. He did 212 Man by Carolina Herrera. He did XS Por Homme uh, by Paco Rabanne with the great Gerard Anthony which that's one that I don't own a bottle of. I would love to. I do own Himalaya, which is very, very close to excess. Uh, he did Herrera for Men from, from 1991, which I also don't own. I would love to own a bottle of that. He did Kajal Om, which is a niche fragrance from 2015. I don't own anything from the Kajal house. And then again, I don't own anything from his own brand. He did a fragrance for Paco Rabanne called Paco in 1996, which was supposed to be a unisex, fresh, citrusy fragrance that was competing with like CK1, you know, when, when unisex was the thing where, you know, it was, you know, CK1 was, was a huge hit in the mid nineties. Paco was supposed to compete with that, for example. Um, and then what else did he do that I saw was a hit? He did CH for women, Carolina Herrera CH for women, 2007. 
And uh, he did Excess Extreme, the flanker to Paco Rabanne Excess in 2000. So he's been around the block outside of the ones that I've shown you, obviously. He was in the industry, like I said, for 45 years. He did one of the original Xenia fragrances from 1992. That's one I'd love to try. Uh, and he did Puige's Vetiver, Vetiver de Puige from 1978. Also kind of a classic. I've never smelled that either. So this is a this is kind of a sad video, unfortunately. He he passed away. Again, they said he had a terrible illness. Hopefully he didn't suffer. Condolences to his family. I um I came home from work today and I actually had no clue what I was gonna do. Uh and I got a text message from Rich Mitch that said Rosen Duma too have passed away. And uh that was that was just a perfect, it was like it was meant to be. And so um honoring the occasion, I'll, I am properly dressed for for an honorary video of his life. And I'm going to try to get to know more of his creations. I like his work. And, uh, you know, anyone that's a master perfumer and has been in the industry for as many years as I have, they, they've seen a lot of change. They've seen, they've, they've, you know, they've got tricks up their sleeve. So I want to smell his work more. I want to get to know his work more. But um, let me know if you have experience with his fragrances, um, you know, that I don't own. If, if there are some that you own that you love, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Uh, I really appreciate everybody watching and I want, and, and if you could leave a comment, you know, if you have experience with some of his work, uh, the interaction with you guys is really one of the things that I love. And uh, especially on a topic like this, where usually I have much more to show you, I only have four fragrances. So uh, the, the group's experience here, I think would be very helpful for everybody to, um, you know, to, to see what other people like and wear and own from him. Um, and so I appreciate you guys watching. Unfortunately, it's a solemn uh, video. You know, somebody's passing, an icon's passing. Uh, but I appreciate everybody watching. And uh, cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye, guys.